Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. I'm William Bell, your co-host along with Don Preston, and uh, Don is here with us today recovering from the, what do you call it, the U-body some kind of rot. <laughs> yeah, the, I call it the Ubangi body rot. <laughs> oh, the Ubangi body rot. <laughs> well, anyway, he's here, ladies and gentlemen, and um, uh, is uh, not doing his best in terms of his voice and uh, still recovering from whatever that illness is he's he's uh, concocted. But uh, we know it's not good and um, uh, just really makes him feel bad. But I think he's feeling better and... and um, has somewhat of his voice, so we're going to try to do the very best we can today. Uh, it's been a little warm in our area, a little bit of the heat and sun, but at the same time it's cooling off now, and looks like we may even get a shower, but I'm not a weatherman, so I'm not going to predict it. <laughs> but at any rate, it'd be nice to have a little bit of cooling off here. How about the weather out there in uh, your land? Well, it's actually been quite moderate, William. Uh, I think we hit a high of 94, 95, something like that. But really, honestly, for here we are, of course, it's the very first day of September. But, uh, I mean, it has just been inordinately uh, cool and pleasant for uh, here in Ardmore, Oklahoma, in August. I mean, uh, boy, it could get really, really miserable here during this time of year. But uh, it's just been super pleasant, really has. Yeah, well, it hasn't been scorching hot here either, so um, I'm grateful for that. And I know everybody is, you know, if you're not getting that blistering heat that sometimes, you know, comes uh, during the summer months, especially late July and uh, throughout the month of August. But at any rate, uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we have a uh, show lined up for you today where we're going to be continuing some studies in the Bellevue Lectures, and uh, today we're going to be discussing, I believe his name is Jerry Brewer? Yes, sir. Okay, Jerry Brewer, and uh, on the nature of prophecy, and um, as I was telling Don a minute ago, I didn't get a chance to hear the lecture, but uh, he's already kind of given me a direction of where it's going, and I can only imagine what the rest of it <laughs> is all uh, about from the perspective that they're taking. But we will um we'll discuss it and um you know try to give you some insights on what's going on. Uh if you are there and you listening to us and you um are in the chat room or thinking about the chat room uh or if you you know want to ask us a question you can come to the chat room, type in your question, we'll try to get it on the air. And uh, or if you call in, uh just have your question question prepared, we'll take that question. Let me give you that number. Very quickly, it is 347-838-8252, 347-838-8252. Now, when you call that number, if you are on your landline, it will be a toll call. So just make sure you are aware of that. Of course, I understand many people have their smartphones today, and they got free long distance and even on their landline. So uh, hopefully you can take advantage of that, and it won't be an expense to you. But we would love to have your question, and uh, we'll uh, be delighted to um, entertain them and provide an answer according to the scriptures. Don, any particular announcements going on in your neck of the country or your world? Well, yeah, no, I I will be headed to Salt Lake City on September the 10th. I'll be uh, speaking September the 11th and the 12th there in Salt Lake City. Uh, Sean McCraney, who 
hosts a TV program entitled The Heart of the Matter, is sponsoring the entire event. He has been promoting the event. I have been hearing from a good number of people who have said they either plan to attend or they wish they could attend because they are very familiar with Sean McCraney's work and uh, said he has been promoting it on his television program quite aggressively. So we're very excited about this. I mean, this is uh, (laughs) right there in the heart of Mormon country. And my theme is going to be the last days because, let's face it, any organization that was established with the name the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, is based upon a tenet, a concept of the last days, that uh, if we can demonstrate that Joseph Smith was not living in the last days, if you and I today are not living in the last days, uh, if the last days, in fact, referred to the last days of the Old Covenant Age of Israel, then that knocks the props out from under basically all future eschatology and reality. Not just Mormonism, not just Adventism, not just Jehovah's Witnesses, not just any of the other end times religions that sprung up in the 19th century. But uh, if, if, if it can be demonstrated that the term the last days, when, you, when it's used in Scripture, is a reference to the last generation of Old Covenant Israel, and that the coming of the Lord came at the end of those last days, then all futurist eschatologies, uh, I mean, they just go by the wayside. There's no question about it. Yeah, that is the case. Um, the sad part is, you know, we have so many people who believe that they are living in the last days. They have arrange their lives according to it in terms of their faith, their outlook on life, uh, their expectation for the future, and many of them, even in the way that they conduct themselves on a day-to-day basis with that uh, false expectation, a lot of fear in their lives. And it's so unfortunate that it is the case. And uh, others find themselves on the wrong side of truth, as the Bible teaches it. Uh, They oppose those who try to correct them and label them as heretics and also do other things to them as well. And it um, becomes very, very unfortunate that uh, we have this situation. That's one of the reasons why we have this broadcast, so that we can help to teach and explain Scripture, hopefully in a way that's easily understood. Uh, some things are a little bit more challenging than others, but you know that's where the work comes in. As the um, Apostle told Timothy, study to show yourself approved to God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So uh, that's what we seek to do, and uh, that's what we'll be doing on today as we critique uh, Mr. Jerry Brewer on the nature of Bible prophecy. Now, you know, we're not taking issue with people because uh, this is just something that we want to do. I don't think either of us enjoys this. Uh, particularly to have to even do it, especially with uh, those who uh, once considered us you know, to be a part of them. We know that they have changed their opinions at this point because of our views. But at any rate, um, you know, we get no personal satisfaction out of this. It's actually painful to have to do something like this you know, when you really think about it. Um, and um, it just shows that we're trying to come to understanding on the Scripture But when others take a stance where they have assumed that everything they say is correct and they are unwilling to even open their hearts and minds, let alone the scriptures, and reexamine some of those things, it makes it uh, very difficult for us to to try to move in some kind of civil dialogue about them. So we, you know, will use this format to explain and to teach and then leave the um, evidence out there for those of you who are listening to determine what you feel is uh, is the correct view, and that's what we do. Absolutely, William. That's 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 very very well said. It, it really isn't uh, a very pleasant thing. It's certainly not a very pleasant thing to to listen to the speakers at the Bellevue Church of Christ lectures. And let me give you, for instance, why uh, when uh, when Jerry Brewer walked to the podium uh, in the in the DVD of his presentation. He walked up there, and he he opened his Bible, and he opened it up to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, anyone familiar with the controversy about covenant eschatology knows that, well, let me put it, let me, let me put it slightly different here. 
anyone familiar with the speakers at the Bellevue Lectureship knows that virtually every single speaker appealed to Second Timothy chapter 2, in which Paul said, starting with verse 16, shun profane and, profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Their word will eat as a canker, of whom is. Now, the King James and New King James and all translations say, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the, the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Well, Mr. Brewer walks to the podium, and he begins his presentation by reading and saying, their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Max King and Don K. Preston. Now, I, I've got to tell you, that's that's really not very pleasant to hear someone use your name like that, accuse you in that manner uh, of being a damnable false prophet, and he used all of those terms, damnable doctrine, false teacher, false prophet, and it is, it's really uncomfortable, and, and of course, <laughs> you know, William, you you and I have certainly developed some pretty thick skin over the years because we've heard this so many times, and yet you still have to flinch a little bit when you when you hear such caustic, acerbic hateful language uh, that that has no room in it, obviously, for dialogue, for mutual study, for the concept of come let us reason together, says the Lord. There, there's none of that attitude. It is, I'm Jerry Brewer, or Michael Hatcher, or Jesse Whitlock, or whoever it might be. And I am here to tell you the way it is. Now, make no mistake, William and I have our very firm convictions about things, but we're also open-minded. We're also willing to think and to rethink, to consider and to reconsider. We've done that constantly down over the years. And yet, when you're dealing with the speakers from the Bellevue Lectureship, you're not dealing with people who are willing to change in any way whatsoever. Change to them is anathema. Change to them means that they would have to admit that they've been wrong in some regard. And they're not about to admit that they've been wrong in any regard. And so when when you hear and when you visualize, you know, uh, visualization is very important in communication. And when you see a man, or you see the men, who would walk to the dais, walk up to the pulpit at the Bellevue Lectures, and not one, I don't think even one of them had a smile on their face about anything, William. Do you, have, do you remember even one of them smiling at any I can't, occasion? I can't remember at this time. I do remember a joke or two being told. I think it was one of the earlier brothers who did so that we critiqued. And, well, that, uh, cause he, that's he was, true. He was talking about, you know, some, um, I don't know, some food or potatoes, potato pie or something. I, I can't remember, but I remember him cracking a joke or something. That's, that's, that's right. Problem. I had forgotten him. He made a little joke. But but the overall demeanor is still one uh, of, wow. I mean, there is absolutely no kindness on any face. There There is no demeanor that manifests a spirit of of love or grace and mercy. It is, I am here to condemn. And that's troublesome. And so here is Jerry Brewer. He walks up there. He reads the verses, inserting Max King and my name into the text. And he says, and of course, now that ga that garnered some laughter from the audience. That garnered some amens. And I just thought, well, yeah, obviously Mr. Brewer has not studied the scriptures. He And the more I listened to him, the more it became evident. He absolutely has not a clue in the world about eschatology. 
Not one clue in this world. And before we close the program, I'll demonstrate how badly, how utterly, horribly, he completely misunderstands the doctrine of biblical eschatology. But anyway, uh, continuing to speak about men such as Max and William and myself, he said, these men are all charlatans. And then he made a claim that just made me fall out of my chair, William. I just simply, it, it gets back to how every speaker that we have listened to, William, completely and totally misrepresents what we believe, what we say, and what we claim. They make some of the most outlandish claims that you just sit back, you shake your head, and you go, how could an honest individual... How could, a, how could an individual that even thinks halfway, you know, a hair's breadth past his nose ever make such an astoundingly bad and false misrepresentation? He said, King claims to be inspired. Oh, wow. <laughs> no. Because when you say, and, and he had earlier said, Max King says this is his interpretation of the Scripture, and this is the truth. Thus, he says, Max King claims to be inspired because when you say this is that, or this is the truth, or that is the truth, then you're saying that you are inspired. And he said, folks, I'm telling you right now, Max King is not inspired. He said when Peter stood up and said this is that, he was inspired. Or when John said, or when Paul said, that th this is the fulfillment, or this is that, or th whatever, they were inspired. And I, he said, I'm telling you right now, Max King and none of these guys are inspired. Well, Brother Hatcher, here's a clue for you. Max King does not claim to be inspired. And William, this is absolutely incredible to me he says anytime somebody stands up and says this is the proper interpretation of scripture they are claiming to be inspired but what what was jerry brewer claiming to do he was standing up there up there saying i'm going to give you the proper interpretation of scripture therefore jerry brewer was claiming to be inspired yeah the very now, thought of I, that <laughs> is is a contradiction, you know, with with them even making that claim because that's exactly what they propose to do: to stand up and give you a proper exegesis of scripture and then tell you that this is what it says. That's exactly right. I mean, I mean, he he was expounding what what well he didn't really didn't really do any exegesis. If you want to get down to exegesis. Uh, he made some claims, but he didn't do any exegesis. And uh, as you and I well know, there is a vast difference between actually doing exegesis and making claims about the Bible. Uh, and all he did was make claims about the Scriptures. He He did not enter into the text and say, Based upon the following words, based upon the following context, based upon the following, we can we we conclude can conclude the following. Now he did try to make one linguistic point, a point that was invalid. The point that he made was completely invalid. But be that as it may, on the great majority of his quote argumentation, he just simply argued about the scriptures and from the scriptures. He did not exegete the scripture. But again, the point of fact is, what, what was Jerry Brewer claiming? He said, he said, I'm telling you right now, here's what this verse means. This is the truth. And I'm paraphrasing him, but that's exactly his point. And yet when Max King says, this is the proper meaning of Scripture, Jerry Brewer says, ah, Max King is claiming to be inspired. Talk about, you know, illogically inconsistent. I mean, it's just horribly inconsistent. How does anybody not hear himself making such a blatant self-contradiction? Well, in his defense, we're all humans. 
all of us have made arguments in the past that when we look back on them, we just go, uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> Tell me I didn't say that. You know, William, I've, uh, you know, every once in a while I'll find an old sermon of mine that I, pre- that I preached during the, uh, during my younger years. And I, I'll read through it, and I just shake my head, and it's just like, oh, please tell me I did not say those things. But I did, thinking that, boy, I've got it together. This is the truth. And, and I'm sure you're the same way. Oh, no doubt whatsoever. So uh, I understand on one level how Jerry Brewer could, uh, could contradict himself. But but the arrogance that he manifested in that, the haughtiness to stand up and say, if you stand up and say this is the way it is, you're claiming to be inspired, and then turn right around two minutes later and say this is the truth. This is what this verse says. This is what this verse actually means. Well, aren't you doing what you just condemned Max King for doing? Or didn't you just do what you condemned all predators for doing? I, I mean – it's just, it's just absolutely amazing. William, he then said, he cited Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in which the Lord, speaking to Satan, said that the seed of the, uh, that he, his seed, or that Satan would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, and her seed would crush his and he cited King. I will give him credit for one thing, William. He actually quoted from Max Max's book. Now, unfortunately, he didn't give the particular book, and he did not give the page number. But at least he gave the quotation. Now, that raises a little bit of a question as to whether or not he was accurately quoting, since he did not give the book or the page number. But I'm going to take it for granted that he was quoting accurately. But he says, citing King, that the bruising of Satan began in A.D. 33 at the cross, but was not finished until A.D. 70. And oh my goodness gracious, he just about came unglued about that. And he said that according to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, that Genesis 3.15 is speaking strictly and solely and exclusively about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That during his public ministry, Jesus began to bruise the head of Satan through casting out the demons, you know, binding him, etc. But at the cross, and through his resurrection, Jesus crushed Satan. Now, we really want to get into this because this is going to be kind of fun here. But he says, King cannot show a syllable in Genesis chapter 3 that speaks of the second coming. Well, this is more than remarkable. Uh, William, could you show us the syllables in Genesis 3? That specifically mentioned even the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? <laughs> there are none there, especially based on the logic that uh, Mr. Brewer is using. Uh, he certainly will not find any syllable of a mention of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in that text from the um, literal uh, you know, perspective that he's um, trying to refute uh, the discussion of, of Max. He just, he says, well, because it doesn't specifically mention uh, the second coming, the second coming is not there. Well, like you were saying, the logic of that means, well, since there's not a word in the text that specifically mentions the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, look, folks, (coughs) so as Don was saying, (coughs) if it does not logic, yeah, Go ahead, William. If it does not state specifically that it is a reference to the second coming of Christ, if that logic is sound, if that logic 
is reasonable and valid, then we would have to exclude any point that we make on that text to refer to anything that is not mentioned in that text. And that's where, you know, a lot of people make errors on the scripture is because they uh, refuse to understand and accept uh, the context of the scripture and to allow the New Testament to even expand on these Old Testament passages. So if the second coming of Christ is not mentioned in that text and is not referred to because it doesn't say anything specific about it, and it actually does, but you could not um, say anything about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because neither is that specifically mentioned in the text. You have to yeah. come to it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. You go ahead and finish. No, I was just going to say, you know, you've, you've got to uh, extract from what is stated based on the evidence that is in the text. And so you learn from the text, and I'm not going to try to exegete it at this point, but, you know, you look at what's in the text. It's a text that came about as a solution, a remedy to the problem which occurred in the garden, and that was sin and death. And what does God offer as a remedy to sin and death? It was the seed of the woman. And not only did he mention the seed of the woman, but he talked about the crushing of the head of the serpent. And so yeah, let's, let's going, not jump too far ahead because I want to save that to yeah, show yeah. That, that, his, that his statement that the second coming is not in the text is simply false. Now, yeah, again, well, the term second coming is not there. That's, we both admit that. But the point of fact is, what the text does say is that the seed of woman would crush the head of Satan. Now, that's, that's all it says. But as William was so very well pointing out, folks, we have to, to take the totality of Scripture. We have to be holistic, to use the term, in our approach to Scriptures. And, you know, it, it's kind of like this. To, to argue that because a given word or term or phrase is not in a given text, that therefore has to mean that that a given doctrine is not there it is such a horrible, horrible hermeneutic. Joel McDermott tried that in my debate with him in 2012, arguing that because the word final term, final resurrection, was not in Isaiah chapter 25, that means that's not what Isaiah 25 was predicting, in spite of the fact that Paul said the resurrection that he was predicting First Corinthians 15, would be when Isaiah 25 was fulfilled. Well, Paul was predicting the final resurrection. The final resurrection would be when Isaiah 25 would be fulfilled. Therefore, Isaiah 25's final resurrection. But Joel McDermott argued a couple of different times. Well, I don't see the words final resurrection in Isaiah 25. And I keep saying this. It absolutely astounds me that when people get so desperate to view. We lost you, Don. You probably are still speaking, and maybe the audience can hear you. I can't hear you. Uh, but I know that what you're saying. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think you're back now. Okay. I don't know what happened there, but. Uh, my, the point I was making, William, was that when, when men get so desperate, either to maintain their own doctrine or to refute what they consider to be false doctrine, that they resort to an absolutely horrible hermeneutic that they would not, under any other circumstance, appeal to. It, it, it just shows their utter desperation. And, and that's what's happening when Jerry Brewer gets up there and says, there's not one syllable in Genesis 3.15, that refers to the second coming. Well, in the, as we've already said, in the first place, he's wrong about that, and we'll show that later on in, in tonight's program. But secondly, what he is saying is the word or the term second coming is not in Genesis 3, therefore the doctrine's not there. But likewise, contrary and equally logically, the, the words and the terms and the phrases of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus are not found in Genesis 3. Therefore, according to Jerry Brewer's so-called logic, that means those doctrines are not there either. So it's just really, really sad to hear men 
stand up and to make such ill-founded, ill-grounded, illogical kind of argumentation. And so he goes ahead to say, he said, folks, there was no 37-year delay. Satan was crushed in 33 A.D. William, if Satan was crushed in 33 A.D., what would that mean? And by the way, let me back up a little bit. He appealed to John 12, 31, 30, uh, John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the uh, uh, God of this world to be cast out. And he said that was, and he focused on the word now. Now. And he said that means immediately. At this time, at this moment. And he said it doesn't mean 37 years later. So he, he emphasized, and his point was, let me read this again, that there was no 37-year delay between that time and the crushing of Satan. Satan was crushed at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So, William, um, if Satan was crushed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, uh, what would that mean? in regard to the doctrine of resurrection? Well, it would mean quite a few things. It would mean death ended in 33 A.D. or 30 A.D., whichever date they want to assign. And um, it would mean that the resurrection has occurred because the resurrection would be victory over death or when the defeat of Satan occurred. Another point last that enemy, I wanted to... Last enemy to be destroyed is death. That's right. That's right. I just wanted to throw this in. You know, if he says uh, the second coming is not there, I don't think that term is used but once in the Scripture in Hebrews 9 and 28. The actual so, term is not even used. <laughs> it, you're, you're actually correct. You're actually correct it isn't. Uh, so he would have to pretty much rule out every other Scripture, you know, just based on his literal um, statement about the term second coming not being mentioned in that verse. But back to the point that you're making. Um, the resurrection would have to have occurred. Death would be defeated. There would be no um, reference to death of any kind uh, from that perspective. That would make the whole point that you started out with, with him uh, alluding to Second Timothy 2, a moot issue. <laughs> He would actually. That would mean, that would mean have, he would have the resurrection yes. fulfilled before we do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I it, well, <clears throat> once again, it astounds me how little thought some of these men put into their their so called argumentation in their zeal in their headlong zeal to give some kind of an answer to covenant eschatology. Uh, they Well, you and I have said this on many different occasions, William. It seems to me like some of these guys make up their arguments as they go along. Uh, he, he says that the war with Satan, Jesus' uh, war with Satan began during, at his temptation. Well, you know, a person might, ag might agree with that. They might kind of go along with that, certainly just for argument's sake. But he has the victory uh, there at the death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection of Jesus. So, folks, and by the way, he appealed to Hebrews chapter 2, 14 and following. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that he through death might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now, William, it seems to me that Mr. Brewer is making... A, uh, a a very, very common error that we hear an awful lot of people make. The writer of Hebrews says that he, through death, might destroy him who had the power of death. Mr. Brewer takes that to mean at the point of death. But that won't even work for Mr. Brewer, will it? No, no, it definitely will not, um, you know, for the very reasons that you're mentioning and that we've stated before. Uh, and Mr. Brewer would come back and say when he's not trying to refute covenant eschatology, 
<laughs> he would come back and tell you, you know, even if he were in a discussion with us, oh, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And he would place that in the future. He'd also go to a text like Revelation 20 and place that in the future. So, he, you know, he can't make an argument that he will live with, that he will abide with, and that even his own brethren would accept based on, you know, the defeat of Satan and death at the, um, at the cross as he's uh, advocating here. It sounds good when you are standing up, you know, uh, claiming to refute covenant eschatology. And, um, you know, in, in the moment of, of getting some emotional, you know, points, but when it comes down to logic and what the scripture actually says, it's just not going to wash. Well, you you alluded to Revelation chapter 20. Let, let's look a little bit closer. What happens at the end of the millennium? Satan and his angels are crushed. They are destroyed. Well, isn't that Genesis 3.15? Well, according to according to Mr. Brewer, no. I mean, we don't, William, according to Mr. Brewer's philosophy, we don't need Revelation chapter 20 and Satan to be cast into the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Death has already been destroyed because here is Satan. Satan is the one that has the power of death, Hebrews two fourteen to 15. Satan has been destroyed, crushed, according to, to Mr. Jerry Brewer. Therefore, death has been destroyed. Well, if death has been destroyed, since Mr. Brewer's view of resurrection is biological uh, resurrection, then why do I still have to die physically? Um, why, why are there still graves out there? Mr. Brewer obviously hasn't thought past the nose on his face, uh, so to speak, in, in his argumentation. If you're going to argue that, that Satan was crushed at the cross of Jesus. And by the way, he, he, he made a big show, pun intended, of Colossians 2, uh, 14 and following, which says that Christ made a show, a spectacle, of them, of principalities and powers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, manifesting his power over them through the cross. Well, nobody, nobody's denying that in the first place. But Mr. Brewer wanted to say that was the crushing of Satan. Well, if it's the cru crushing of Satan, then we have to ask the question. In Romans 16.20, Paul wrote Romans, I, I date it 57 to 59 A.D., and I think that's where most of the scholarship is on that. But if, uh, if Paul wrote Romans in 57 to 59 A.D., Paul said, And now the God of peace will crush... Satan under your feet shortly. And the word shortly there is from the Greek word or Greek term, entakai. It's only used seven times in the New Testament. It never refers to rapidity as opposed to imminence of action. In other words, it never talks about how rapidly something would occur as opposed to how soon it would come to be. Never. Absolutely never. So here is Paul writing over 25 years, give or take, after the cross when Jerry Brewer tells us Satan was crushed, when Satan was destroyed, that's the term of Hebrews 2, that he might destroy him who had the power of death. And Mr. Brewer says that was at the cross. According to Mr. Brewer, Satan was crushed, Satan was destroyed at the cross. And yet, here is Paul in Romans 16, 20, saying that Satan was about to be crushed shortly, imminently, soon. And here is John in the book of Revelation anticipating Satan being cast into the lake that burns the fire and brimstone. And that was about to take place. It was shortly. It was coming quickly. It was soon. Well, uh, 
That raises a real interesting question for Mr. Brewer, doesn't it, William? If, and I do not know because he did not express himself on this, if Mr. Brewer takes the uh, historicist, the all-millennial view of Revelation, that it was written after the fall of Jerusalem in approximately 95, 98 A.D., uh, then uh, what event close to John occurred in which Satan was cast in the lake that burns in fire and brimstone? Or if he puts it at the end of the end of the Christian age, which is the his source's view, then that means Satan wasn't destroyed at the cross. It means he wasn't crushed at the cross. Now, he is right to say and to point out from Max King, who says that the cross was the triumphant victory of Jesus Christ, and that Max himself points to Colossians chapter 2 and says that this is the initiation of the victory of Christ, but it's not the consummation of the victory of Christ. That the consummation of the victory would take place at the second coming, at the coming of the Lord, to destroy the devil. Well, that doesn't work in Mr. Brewer's little tirade against covenant eschatology when he stands up and over and over and over tells us, no, Satan was destroyed, Satan was crushed at the cross. And you know, William, I just simply could not help but want, as I sat and listened to it, it just made me wonder. And that. And the reason it made me wonder is because I heard several people saying amen to Mr. Brewer's lesson. So I'm going, have, the, have none of these guys ever read Romans 16, 20? If Satan was crushed, how could Peter write in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, and walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If he'd already been crushed and destroyed, how was that possible? I mean, am I missing something here, William? No, you're not missing anything. I mean, it's there in the scriptures. Um, I just don't think they ever read it with the uh, eminent emphasis that it has in the text. Uh, they don't think about what their views are. You know, they're probably not even thinking eschatology when they read the text. I, I have no idea uh, what's on their minds when they uh, read that text. But it certainly is not speaking of something that has already occurred in um, in the context where it's found. It is speaking of something that at the time was yet future. And as you said, the text in First Peter 5 indicates the same, and not just there, but you know, several other passages as well. And, you know, you talked a moment ago about, you know, at or through. And that, that's another area where I see breakdowns in the exegesis of Scripture. You know, just failing to understand those simple pronouns um, and how they're used. You know, they, they're they very important. There's a difference between at by and through, in and out, etc. That's why they're there to give us <laughs> some understanding of, you know, where and when something happens according to, you know, its uh, location or the sphere in which it occurs, etc. All of that is um, is vital to um, have a good understanding of Scripture. And guys, just read over it. You know, they'll look at it and say this happens at that time when it says it happens through something. Therefore, you know, it isn't speaking of when necessarily it happens, but the medium through which it happens or, um, you know, that process that, that goes on. And so that's where some of the error is coming from as well. And they just don't pay that much attention to those statements, nor to those time statements that you're emphasizing uh, that speak well beyond the cross. The God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. You know, it doesn't read, he has crushed him under your feet shortly in that text. He will crush him uh, under your feet shortly. And, and it, that, you know, that was something that was true. That, that was an admonition that Paul was giving to them for the persecution and the struggle through which they were going. You know, he told them in Romans 12, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
He's trying to encourage them under trial because of the persecutions that they're facing, uh, persecutions that were throughout the entire Testament, uh, New Testament, which you know you're well aware of and has done you know a tremendous amount of study on. This was a part of their inspiration, their motivation, in order for them to remain faithful, that God was going to remove uh, the um, persecutions and the um, suffering that they were experiencing. And as you were saying a moment ago, you know, where is such an event that takes place in 95 or 96 A.D., where they want to place, you know, say the book of Revelation or Revelation 20, et cetera. It just isn't there. Well, let's move on just a little bit, because he, he makes another completely misrepresentative claim concerning Max and Preterist. He said, Max King says that all prophecy, he emphasized the word all, must be interpreted spiritually. Every bit of it. And I, once again, I'm sitting there going, I'm pretty sure you haven't read all of Max King. When, when, I, read, when I read people make, or hear people making such ridiculous claims, I, I just cannot help but be completely offended because it tells me, number one, they have not read what we have said. Number two, if they've read it, they haven't tried to read with understanding. Number three, if they have read it and if they understood it, they're purposely misrepresenting what we are saying. To say that preterist, to say that Max King, and that preterist insist that all prophecy must be interpreted spiritually, none of it is to be interpreted literally, is a blatant falsehood. I don't know of preterists, personally, I don't know of any preterists who deny that Isaiah chapter 7 foretold the literal virgin birth. Do you, William? No, I don't know of any who would deny that, any who don't believe okay. that it was you know, an actual birth. I, I don't know of any preterists who deny that Psalms 53, excuse me, Isaiah 53, foretold the literal physical suffering of Jesus Christ, even his literal physical resurrection. I don't know of any deny that. If every preterist that I'm aware of takes those as prophecies and predictions of the literal physical suffering, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So... It's ridiculous for Mr. Brewer to stand up there and say, ah, you see, all these preterists, they spiritualize every single prophecy, when it's not even close to the truth. But I want, I want us to pay particular attention uh, in the time we have left here, William, because uh, he, he spent a good bit of time on Matthew chapter 24, uh, and I don't know if we want to spend our next program examining what he had to say on that or not. But let, we'll consider that. But nonetheless, he said, for instance, he said, let me give you a, a prime example of King's misuse of prophecy. He said, King appeals, King says the word world, as used in Scripture, refers to the world of Abraham and the world of Judaism. And he said he offers Psalms 102 as an example of that, and he says that King admits, he even reads a couple of words from uh, one of Max's books. I, he didn't give the reference. But he said, King says it must be admitted that a, a surface reading would indicate that this is talking about the material world. Oh, and then he scoffed. <coughs> Pardon me. He laughed, and he said, a surface reading. And his point was, we ought to accept the surface reading without going any deeper. But he said, he went ahead to read Max's comment, a surface reading might indicate that this is talking about the material creation. A closer look, however, reveals that it's talking about the covenant world of Abraham, 
the world that came into existence uh, with Abraham and at Sinai in the giving of Torah. And, of course, I'm sitting there going, yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Well, of course, Mr. Brewer can't accept that. And he says there's not one thing <coughs> in Psalms 102 to suggest what Max King teaches. <coughs> oh, pardon me. <coughs> I've just about done all my voice is going to let me do, but okay. I just have to get through this. I could not help but reflect that just recently on Facebook, <clears throat> a guy by the name of Scott Russell was po has been posting on there, and he posted on there something like this. Since the physical creation is going to come to an end, what will happen to all of the people on earth when it comes to an end? Well, I posted on in response immediately you are taking it for granted that the physical earth is going to come to an end based upon your presuppositional theology. Well, then he posted back, and he said, it's, no, it's not presuppositional. It's the law of second, second law of thermodynamics. So <clears throat> instead of presenting scripture, he presented thermodynamics. Well, that's a totally separate discussion. But I kept pressing him and kept pressing him. <coughs> Pardon me. To give us a text from the Old Testament that predicts the destruction of physical heaven and earth. I had a pretty good idea of what text he would appeal to. I've had it happen over and over. You've had it happen over and over, William, that they run to Psalms 102. And so here is Psalms 102. says, You, Lord, in the beginning made the heavens and the earth. They shall grow old. They shall wax old, and you shall fold them up as a garment. So here he says, See, this is the second law of thermodynamics at work. It says they shall grow old as a garment and be folded up. That's the end of time being predicted. Well, this is just another example in which people from the historicist, millennial perspective, who have no clue whatsoever about what the Old Testament actually predicted and prophesied, Oh, they can cherry-pick a verse here and there. But seldom, if ever, have they actually done any in-depth exegesis, as we've already demonstrated with the shallowness of Mr. Brewer's comments. In response to Mr. Russell, and I would ask Mr. Brewer the same question, since you are claiming that Psalms 102 predicts the so-called end of time <coughs> I apologize folks this uh, this respiratory infection that got a hold of me has been about one of the worst that I've, I've had and believe me I've, uh, <laughs> I, I've had plenty of them but uh, anyway it just refuses to let go but in Psalms 102 the writer says he is speaking events far off, and I, I'm going to begin just reading here, Psalms 102, verse 16. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Okay, so we have the destruction of heaven and earth at the coming of the Lord. Well, it's for the redemption of Zion. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. Now watch this, folks. Watch this carefully. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. 
For he has looked down from the height of the sanctuary, from heaven did the Lord behold the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those who are, uh, that are appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the gathering, or when the people are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord, and then he goes directly into the statement of the heaven and earth passing away. So I would pose the question to Mr. Brewer, as I did, to Scott Russell. Since this passing of heaven and earth here is at the coming of the Lord in his glory, please tell us who the new people are that will be created at this coming of the Lord. Because it's, it emphatically says that a people yet to be created will glorify the name of the Lord. Okay, so what new people will be created when heaven and earth is destroyed? Well, here's what happened with Mr. Scott Russell. He abandoned the discussion and hasn't come back since. And that's been over a week ago. I suspect Mr. Brewer would do the same. Because, after all, he doesn't believe the church will ever be destroyed and another new people created. And certainly a new people will not be created at the coming of the Lord. He doesn't believe that. If you were to ask Mr. Brewer, and by the way, if you were to ask Scott Russell, in a conversation having nothing to do with covenant eschatology, if, you, if, if neither man knew that you were a preterist, and you were to ask them, uh, so far as the Bible is concerned, what people was to be destroyed in order to create a new people, they would, without any question whatsoever, without any equivocation, without any hesitation, they would say, well, Old Covenant Israel was supposed to be destroyed in order for God to create their New Covenant people. William, am I right on that? Do you believe that that's correct? Yes, that is correct, that the Old Covenant people would be destroyed in order to create the New people. That's the text in Second Corinthians 5. Absolutely. And it's Isaiah 65. And it's yes. Isaiah 62. Uh, any number of passages can be cited uh, to the effect that God was going to destroy the old covenant people and create a new covenant people. Oh, but oh, wait a minute. Mr. Brewer has cherry-picked, proof-texted Psalms 102, 25, and 26 that talk about the destruction of heaven and earth. Well, he believes that's literal. Well, if you take the destruction of heaven and earth as literal in the text, then you've got to take the creation of the new people as literal as well. And that forces you to the position of saying the church will one day be, be destroyed and God will create a brand new people. Uh, Mr. Brewer has impaled himself on his own verses by saying... Psalms 102 is absolutely not spiritual. Psalms 102 is literal. Well, okay, if it's literal, then a new people will be created at the coming of the Lord in glory, at the destruction of literal physical heaven and earth. And yet Mr. Brewer, and by the way, not another speaker on the Bellevue Lectureship. Not one other speaker believes that the church will be destroyed at the coming of the Lord when heaven and earth, literal heaven and earth, are destroyed. Not one of them. And yet, by taking Psalms 102 literal and claiming it has to be interpreted literally, and by the way, what did Mr. Brewer say? This is the truth of Psalms 102. I'm paraphrasing. <clears throat> but he was absolutely adamant that Max King is wrong, and that he is right on Psalms 102. Therefore, back to the point at the beginning of the program, guess what? Mr. Brewer is claiming to be inspired because he's telling us that his interpretation is, without a doubt, the correct interpretation. And, William, that's all the time we have, and that's all the voice that I have. So I want to say to all of our listeners this evening, 
thank you so very much for joining Two Guys in the Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. Good night, and God bless. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in the Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Dunn Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day, and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust.